In the last episode, we discovered how Julius Caesar came to Britain, defeating the tribes on his second attempt. Caesar had definitely put Britain on the Roman map. It was now within the sphere of their influence and trade had begun in earnest across the channel. But Britain was still beyond the official borders of the Roman Empire, paying only a token tribute to Rome. And that would remain the case for almost a hundred years. It wasn't till Claudius becomes emperor that there is a serious threat to Britain again. Claudius arrives as emperor with a huge question mark over his ability to be emperor. He needs to prove himself. When he took power in 41 AD, Claudius was frail and inexperienced. He thought that a military triumph was what he needed to cement his position. And that was the spur that would bring about the invasion of Britain. And it was a big step. Everybody knew that Caesar had had a tough time in Britain and Caesar was no lightweight. Claudius looked to Britain, he saw the stocked warehouses in Gaul and thought, this is it, this is my make or break opportunity to prove my worth. To do so, he looks to his top general, Aulus Plautius, and he sets in motion the most professional maritime invasion force of the age. In many ways, we won't see anything like this invasion until the Normandy landings in 1944. One of the things that really interests me about these Roman invasions is the crossing of the Channel. You know, the Romans feared the Channel, they called it Oceanus, and it is an incredibly dangerous waterway. The, the tidal currents here are very, very strong. It's a narrow waterway, and of course, the weather is very fickle. When Caesar embarked to come to Britain, his men just jumped on the boats and away they went. I think his legionnaires would have followed him into the teeth of a volcano. They had such faith in him. When the Claudian invasion is preparing to set forth across the channel, they hesitated. And it was only when Narcissus, a former slave who'd become free, attempted to address them on, on behalf of Plautius and Claudius, that the legionaries became indignant and said, don't you talk to us. And then out of their indignation, they board the ships and come to Britain. With the soldiers finally on board, Plautius sets off for Britain. When Caesar had first landed in Britain on this stretch of the Kent coast, he'd faced a fierce fight to get on shore. So this time the Romans weren't taking any chances. This was a masterpiece in military planning. There had been a big build-up for this. There were more ships, the invasion fleet, maybe 800 ships. The Britons had got word of a build-up in Gaul and military activity, but then it never seemed to come and the season got later and later and later and eventually they thought, as had happened on previous occasions, the Roman army had changed its mind. And so the British warriors dispersed. But of course, they hadn't changed their mind. Imagine this scene. Perhaps 800 ships packed with crack legionnaires, with auxilia, with cavalry, with supplies and enough food to stay here for several months. This was a new type of invasion. This was an invasion with the intent of conquest. Of course, the Britons had faced the Romans before, but that was almost a century ago. Roman technology had moved on since then. To find out how a Claudian soldier's equipment was different, I met up with a group of reenactors, Legio II Augusta. Well, here we have a brilliant example of how things changed in that hundred years in the way of armour. Gone is the chain shirt and we have the plated, what is called Lorica Segmentata, but the Romans called it a cuirass. The sword is a short stabbing sword, shorter than the early. Yeah. This is a Mainz pattern blade. Um, it's slightly wasted along the straight edge 
and it has a longer, thinner tip than the Pompeii style sword, which I have here. Both were in common use. At that time. So this, this is a lot simpler to make, I suspect, and it looks less fragile. Yeah. Yes. This tip. is the slightly older version. A slightly older version. Around the waist, we've got a patterned belt with belt plates. Hundreds and hundreds of different styles of belt plate have been found. Some are patterned, some are plain, some have colour on them. In fact, there's so many different types, possibly every Roman soldier had his own design. Down below that, we've got the apron, the Kingilum, Kingilum Militare, uh, with very decorative pendants on the end. There's certainly no creeping up on anybody. On the belt was another weapon, the Roman Pugio. A dagger, again, with that large, very small entry, widening wow. out very quickly. So if your sword was broken, knocked out of your hand, you had you could still, another weapon. You could still thrust yep. with it, but I guess it was a finisher offer, wasn't it? Easily. Both weapons of this type are designed to cause massive hemorrhaging. Um, and only two inches in the right place, Roman writers tell us, was enough. But just jumping back to the armour for a moment, you'll see its design is to protect the person far more from a slashing weapon than yeah. a stabbing weapon. Yeah. Um, once again, the Iron Age tribes haven't adapted after facing Caesar's troops, and the idea is that it'll get hit on the shoulder and mm. slide yeah. off harmlessly. And deflect it, yep. The helmet is typical of the period. The eyebrows aren't there to make it look pretty, they're actually there um, to strengthen the metal at the front of the helmet. Again, against a, 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 yes. a, a slashing attack, as with that visor. As, yes, the brow band is there. Now, the Romans did have a thing about people's ears, because many Romans believed that when you were born, your soul entered through your ear, and when you died, it left through the other ear. <laughs> so we generally find very good ear guards on Roman helmets so that you didn't lose a piece or all of one of those precious ears. But, but interestingly, the, the, the helmet's designed not to occlude your hearing. So obviously there were all, all you know, we know orders were being given and you had to be able to hear them. Broad neck guard on the back, again, would protect the man from a slashing weapon. And overall, this is a heavily armoured infantryman. Yeah. What does it weigh? 60 pounds in all. Wow. With everything, shield, javelin, armour, helmet, these were the soldiers that were now on British soil. And this is where we believe those soldiers spent their first night, at Richborough in Kent. Here I'm meeting Roman historian Simon Elliott to find out more about the Claudian invasion force. For me, this is literally the most important site in Roman Britain because it's the beginning and the end of the Roman occupation in Britain. So is this where you think Aulus Plautius had his marching camp? I think it is, and in actual fact the archaeology proves it because we found the ditches from the invasion marching camp the Romans built here. It's worth remembering that when the Roman military campaigning anywhere in enemy territory at any time in their history, at the end of every marching day or fighting day, they don't stop and make the tea and put the tents up. They spend three hours manually, physically building a marching camp, which is a temporary fort. And they do that quickly. I mean, these, these camps are impressive things. Absolutely, and, and the scale here is astonishing. It's like an invasion beachhead, effectively, because the, we've uncovered around 600 metres of just the eastern wall, which is right behind the later Saxon shore fort wall over there. The walls we can see here are later, built around the 3rd century AD. But these ditches are believed to be part of that initial marching camp. It's astonishing to think that these earthworks may have been dug by the Roman invasion force on their very first day in Britain. We can imagine now the troops, they didn't sleep the night before. They've, uh, they've come across Oceanus, the channel which they, we know that the Romans feared, and it is a fearsome piece of water. And they've landed, what do they do next? It, it, the first thing I would say, Ray, is to remember they've had a very long day <laughs> because basically they as, as you say the night before they probably not slept this is a terrifying prospect so they come across 
Um, they're expecting opposition, doesn't arrive, but even then they're now in enemy territory. It's been a long time since the Romans have arrived here. Um, so the first thing they do is they send out their scouts to make sure that the, wherever they're landing, all the way up and down the coast, by the way, is, is fairly protected and they're not going to be attacked as they're landing. Once they're sure of that, then they start building the marching camp for the night. Um, now, a marching camp is a fortified base which will protect them from enemy attacking. So what you're looking at, you're looking at probably a double or triple ditch, probably about five metres wide and two to three metres deep, with an ankle breaker in the bottom to snap the ankle of anybody who tries to go through it if he doesn't place his foot properly in the bottom, with stakes either side. And then the earth from the ditches gets turned into a bank on the inside. And then each of the legionaries and auxiliaries carry a stake as part of their engineering kit. And each stake goes to make a palisade. Now the one here is immense. And this is only one of probably many up and down the coast. This is probably the headquarters because it's such a great place to land. And we know here at least from the Eastern Wood Ditch that it's probably about 600 meters or more long. And we've even found the, the, the fortified gate they built on the very first night they landed in Britain. Why here? I, I can only assume that this must have been the GHQ for that invasion force. I, I think, remember where you are. So all around you is gonna be water. So you, this is originally built on an islet. So the fields behind here, the fields here, they're all water. It's the Wonsum Channel, which is a really big waterway in the Roman period, isolating the Isle of Thanet over there and the high ground over there on the north coast of Kent from um, here. So basically this, location here was a perfect place to put as you say the GHQ of the Roman invasions of Britain. And early on after they've arrived they would have sent out their reconnaissance troops, their explorates, they would have sent out their foraging troops all mounted to get the lay of the land, find out where the enemy are and raid local villages for food. Absolutely essential. It's worth remembering as well though that from the time Caesar invaded 90 odd years earlier Britain was on the Roman map to an extent. And I think personally that they cased the joint. I think that too. Yeah. I think exactly that. The key thing that was missing in Caesar's invasions was reconnaissance. And the Romans were very sophisticated in their reconnaissance. And we hardly know anything about their reconnaissance troops, just as we wouldn't today. They were secret. But we do know they had these troops called speculatories, who were the spies of their age. So that's absolutely true. The Romans had two things in abundance. They had grit to come back after they'd lost and they'd learned from their mistakes. And also they, they were very good at adapting the weapons and technology and ideas and tactics of their opponents. And with the speculatories, that all comes into one. So they learned all the mistakes from Caesar 55 and 54 BC. So when Plautius came here on behalf of the new Emperor Claudius, who really was desperate to make his name, this was a huge Hail Mary for the Romans, let's face it. Um, the speculatories would have been all over the place. This was a very well planned and executed invasion. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.